reported 30 new COVID-19 cases in the community. 11 of them are currently unlinked. In the past few weeks, Singapore was hit by a resurgence of COVID-19 cases, many of them unlinked, triggering heightened measures to stop the spread. The culprit, new strains of COVID-19 such as the B1617 variant, which are said to be more infectious. At the time of this recording, Singapore has 10 confirmed cases of the B1617 strain and over 40 preliminary cases, meaning there are pending confirmed tests. In this episode of Talking Point, join me and my guests as we get through all your burning questions on the B1617 strain. Just how worried should we be and what can we do to stay safe? Welcome all to the discussion. David, you've said that we are in a far more serious situation now compared to the past. How so? I don't mean to alarm people, but we do know that this B1617 is more transmissible. And uh, when you look at the daily reports from MOH, uh, we do see more unlinked cases. I think that is what concerns me. There have been a number of hospital infections, the most recent one being St. Kang Hospital. To what extent, Janil, has our healthcare system been affected? Well, to a significant extent. Firstly, because our healthcare workers and our healthcare system are at the front line every single day. They're essential to how we deal with the virus. So, so there's two levels. One is the burden that they have to uh, carry in terms of the fight and the number of patients that they have to swab and screen and blood test as well as admit for quarantine, as well as the patients who actually have COVID-19. And then there's the other level, which is their ongoing work uh, actually has been uh, in a way impacted because of all the, the extra work that they've had to do and the extra precautions that they've had to take. David, what kinds of COVID-19 cases do you see at NCID and have you seen a rise in the number of cases? Well, certainly uh, there, are, there are more patients now in NCID as well as the other hospitals uh, than several months ago. But we are still uh, seeing uh, mostly uh, uh, patients who are quite well. So many of our patients uh, have no symptoms. Uh, if you compare to the number of intensive care uh, last year in, in uh, March, April and May, compared to now, the numbers are very positively lower. I've also read reports that the B1617 is so infectious that it can actually penetrate masks as well as PPE, personal protective equipment suits. Is there any truth to that? The answer is no. If you wear your mask properly, it will be fairly protective in the public space. Okay, But what we know is many people don't wear their mask properly, right? I've seen so many people wearing their mask below their nose, on their chin. And the other thing is that not all paper masks is the same, right? There are some paper masks which are basically not even three-ply. And so it's very important to make sure you get the right surgical mask. So not all masks are the same. All of these measures are not going to be 100% foolproof. So I have this thing called the Swiss cheese approach, where each measure are going to have some holes in it. But when you align all of the measures, the holes do not align and the virus will not be able to penetrate through those defensive layers. So the mask is not going to be 100% effective. It's not meant to be, but it's effective to a very high degree. But as a, what David has mentioned, wearing the mask properly and choosing a proper mask is actually extremely important because in not wearing the mask properly, you actually have essentially removed the entire layer of defense. At this point, uh, we don't have any evidence to suggest that this particular virus is any different from the other uh, earlier COVID strains in terms of making masks or other uh, measures less effective. So, so these still continue to be extremely effective at preventing the spread of disease. Is the virus now airborne? The transmission for every, any respiratory um, virus, which are you know, COVID-19 included, uh, it's actually a continuum from, you know, sort of large droplets to smaller droplets and, and of course, aerosols, uh, what, what you call, you know, airborne transmission. So it's actually a continuum. All the while, we knew that there is a possibility at the end of the spectrum that a virus could be airborne in certain circumstances, but that the majority of spread still occurs through the droplet route and also if hygiene is not optimal. Just what is this B1617 variant and why is it called a double mutant? Let's take a look. 
The B1617 variant got its double mutant nickname because of two worrisome mutations in its genetic composition, E484Q and L452R. But in fact, it contains a total of 13 spike protein mutations. The mutations appear to make it more transmissible. Estimates put it at a whopping 225% more infectious compared to the original COVID-19 strain responsible for Singapore's circuit breaker in May 2020. So if you were to do the math, every infected individual with the B1617 strain would infect 8 others compared to just 2.5 others if the same person is infected with the original COVID-19 strain. We know that the B1617 is very transmissible, but is it more deadly? So that's something that uh, you know we are still trying to study together with uh, others around the world um, who uh, have a lot more cases and trying to look at this. I think um, while a lot of cases are certainly mild or even asymptomatic, um, there remains a small proportion of individuals who will develop more severe disease and or even die from that disease. That's why we have to still continue with the measures that we have taken to try to reduce the number of infections because it's, it is a probability a little bit like buying a lottery in a sense you know um, when you have covid there's a probability of becoming severe probability of dying and that's why we're trying to get our infections as low as possible because the larger number of people that you have infected the chances of actually winning that lottery and becoming a severe case is actually very high can people who are asymptomatic still transmit the disease Yes, that's a central feature of coronavirus since the start. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we, we can't just limit our uh, interventions socially or medically only to people who are symptomatic. You don't just wear a mask only when you're unwell. We're asking everybody to wear a mask uh, when they're in contact with other people. So part of that is because there is the possibility for asymptomatic transmission. That's not new. The other thing is that we have been starting this uh, since uh, we, we started seeing this 1617, uh, that the mild virus in our, in our patients uh, is not lower just because they have no symptoms. Uh, and, uh, but of course, if they have no symptoms, they're less likely to cough and sneeze, and that is helpful. And that's why wearing masks is very important. And, and you can't say you have no COVID because there are no symptoms. We have seen an increase in the number of unlinked cases in the community since the beginning of the year. How much is this is due to the B1617 strain? The higher transmissibility of the 1617 strain certainly may result in there being more unlinked cases because the transmission is uh, more extensive or even faster. Is the B1617 making contact tracing more of a challenge? Well, it certainly is making contact tracing more challenging because if the virus spreads to more people um, quicker, then we have then got more cases to have to deal with. And we also have to ring fence very widely to ensure that there's no leaks from the contact tracing rings. However, the principles of contact tracing still remain the same. We will interview the patient. We will use new tools, for example, like the Trace Together app and Save Entry to identify additional contacts. And we also will throw a very wide ring to test and identify new cases and then contact trace around those cases as well. And we have to do it a lot quicker. We have to do it a lot more extensively. So we really need the public to be on our side to use, for example, the Trace Together app to do their safe entry when they enter different venues and also to see a doctor when they have symptoms so that we can identify those cases early and do the contact tracing early. From what I can see, the uh, experience that the contact tracing teams have had over the last year, months, actually means that you're, you're moving much faster. Uh, so even if the, if the rings of isolation have to be larger and you have to go and after more people, you're actually able to do that faster than you did previously. Uh, uh, so, so that's a good thing. Singapore is on top of the list for countries infected by the B1617. How did this happen? Well, the B1617 variant is becoming uh, very prevalent globally. So it's uh, detected in those countries that uh, do very robust uh, testing and tracing phylogenetic analyses. But I'm fairly confident that actually it's found in several other countries which perhaps don't have quite as uh, extensive uh, testing regime. It's, it's there, but perhaps it's just not labeled as such. 
And so it's become prevalent in many, many countries uh, as we speak. And we've had to remain partially open to the world. We haven't been able to take the same strategy as places like Australia and New Zealand uh, because we, we are dependent for a number of reasons on all kinds of things from around the world, including people. And so we've been exposed and we've had to maintain a certain level of risk in terms of maintaining that exposure. So simply put, we haven't been able to close our doors completely. And so the virus gets in. How equipped are we to fight this newer 1617 variant? I actually think we are very well equipped. Both of us wear masks a lot more than uh, we did uh, before the pandemic. I think that's a good thing. And then most of us do keep the distance and stick to the numbers. So that, that's important. That, that is what will, will differentiate uh, us from a big epidemic. And I think the other second thing is the more you test, the more you picked up uh, silent cases, and, and the third thing is uh, our ability to, uh, to test is now so much better. And genetic sequencing is a new technology that's used extensively now, and it's enabled us to, uh, to make the link between the different clusters. And then Singapore is one of the countries that is able to sequence a, a very high proportion of, the, of our cases, and as well as in a very short time. The virus is a natural force. It's always looking for ways to mutate, to try to be more efficient at transmitting. This is just a natural evolution of the virus. So whatever we do, we shouldn't be fighting today's battle. We should be looking at what might happen in the future and see what are the technologies, what are the enhancements that we can make based on the lessons that we have learned to try to make uh, the containment and reducing the spread of the virus better the next time around. In May alone, we saw over 40 kids from 30 schools getting infected. Do we know how many of these uh, infections are the B1617 variant? And are kids more vulnerable to this? Welcome back. There are concerns that the newer, faster transmitting COVID-19 strains like the B1617 could reduce vaccine efficacy and contribute to breakthrough infections. Now, these are infections in people who are fully vaccinated. The Pfizer and Moderna vaccines have been found to be likely effective against the B1617. Why then are we still seeing infections? So the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are highly effective against the COVID-19 strains that are circulating at the moment. But of course, it is not 100% uh, effective. There will always be some individuals that will get breakthrough um, infections uh, for a variety of reasons. But I think the most important thing to realize is that the vaccine does prevent the majority of individuals from getting infected. So that's the part that we need the public to understand that it is important to get vaccinated because you will be able to prevent most of the infections. And for the few individuals that get infected due to breakthrough infections, they also tend to get much less severe disease. So on these two counts, it is very important to get vaccinated. The vaccine interval will be extended from four weeks to between six to eight weeks. Will this be a potential breeding ground for vaccine-resistant mutants? Uh, the answer is no. The data from uh, UK and Israel shows that, you know, the Pfizer vaccines and the Moderna vaccines still protects up to about 80% in, uh, before the second dose. So that's another one. Number two is that the latest study from UK basically shows that the antibody level is still quite good. For example, although the antibody level is not as high uh, after the first dose, before the second dose, the number of people who develop infections are still much lower, suggesting that there's other parts of the immune system that protect you. So if you don't get COVID, there's no risk for mutations. Another way of looking at it is that the first dose is effective but the second dose is necessary for it to have a long-lasting effect. A worrying trend is the kids, the school children, getting infected. In May alone, we saw over 40 kids from 30 schools getting infected. Do we know how many of these infections are the B1617 variant? And are kids more vulnerable to this? Yeah, uh, we know that some of the children have gotten the uh, B1617 uh, infections. Um, we don't think that children are any more vulnerable to uh, this particular strain than from other strain 
uh, at the moment um, from the data from other countries. We're just seeing more transmissions occur in children now because of the settings at which they have occurred. Now, um, with the Pfizer vaccine being approved for use in children above the age of 12, uh, for children who are eligible to be vaccinated as well, they can get protected from infection. As a mother, uh, the fact that the Singapore government has approved to use the use of Pfizer in children 12 to 15 is very interesting to me. So, Janil, what I want to know is, will the vaccine be made compulsory for school children? Well, it's a voluntary vaccination program and we do encourage people to, as far as possible, take it up. And the more they take it up, the better for all of us. The progress into vaccinating children is natural. I mean, this is how all vaccines work. You test it out on healthy young males and then eventually you broaden to have more and more groups in the population. And now that we have evidence that it is both safe and effective in children, we're going to roll it out to the 12 to 15 year olds. Uh, but it remains a voluntary program. Okay. Um, in, in some countries, like the UK, for example, they are testing students regularly to detect, in particular, the asymptomatic cases. Is this something that Singapore will consider? So, routine testing is always based on the idea that there is a risk associated with that. So, at the moment, there isn't any evidence to suggest that the schools are a particularly high-risk location compared to some of the other activities uh, that we carry on with. And in particular, because the schools have been effective at introducing a variety of measures to protect hygiene and social distancing, we're quite confident that the risk level for schools remains unchanged. Singapore has returned to phase two of tightened measures for nearly three weeks now. When will we see an end to this? Well, we're already starting to see the positive effects of our restrictions, but we haven't quite seen the reduction we would like. With new strains of the COVID-19 virus circulating within the community and pockets of unlinked cases, the situation can deteriorate rapidly anytime. So I want to know what else can we do to stay safe? David, there's been talk about forming social bubbles to protect ourselves. How will this work? So the idea of social bubble is you basically stick to the people that matter most to you to reduce your inadvertent exposure to cases of COVID that we haven't detected. This is not a time to be very socially active. This is a time to, to keep in touch with people that matter uh, and at the same time try to contribute to, uh, to the control of, of this virus in our community. So that's the concept of social bubble. How many of these bubbles should we have and how big should they be? Oh, you really only should have one social bubble. If you have too many social bubbles, you are basically uh, increasing your risk. I, I want to talk a little bit about mask wearing. Have we seen the surge in cases because we have been lax with our masks wearing? Most Singaporeans um, have been rather, um, I would say, good at, at mask wearing, but we can never rest on our laurels. And recently, what we have advised the public uh, is to choose masks with uh, better protection uh, which will help us to mitigate these risks of transmission and infection. What I mean by better protection is choosing a mask with um, a high filtration uh, efficiency, um, which is uh, an example of a mask with a good protection. So, for example, the surgical mask is one example of mask with a good filtration efficiency. But of course, there are also reusable masks. And there are many reusable masks that also have good filtration efficiency. So examples of such reusable masks that have good filtration uh, efficiency include those distributed by the People's Association and by Tomasic Foundation. So reusable masks that uh, have this uh, high filtration efficiency tend to be those with at least two or three layers of a uh, fabric and also those where you can actually insert a uh, filter. So like in this case, this mask that I have, you have a filter insert that you can actually insert into the mask and will also provide very good protection. I have seen people double masking. They put a layer of surgical mask and then they have another cloth mask, for example, on top of it. What do you think of that? This is something that some people might do, but most important is in fact wearing a good mask properly rather than trying to put too many layers sometimes what happens when people put too many layers is that the comfort decreases and when one layer slips on top or, or on the other layer and you have to adjust the mask and you fiddle with it actually every time you touch a mask increases the opportunity for transmission because you're actually 
uh, you know, touching your face and, and if your hands are not well cleaned, then you increase opportunities for transmission. Janil, Singapore has returned to phase two of tightened measures for nearly three weeks now. When will we see an end to this? Well, we're already starting to see the positive effects of our restrictions. The number of cases has held steady and hopefully starting to reduce. We haven't quite seen the reduction we would like, but it certainly hasn't increased. And that shows that the measures are working. We will need to see a sustained fall in the number of cases, especially the community unlinked cases. Uh, and then we need to be able to have it held steady at a very low number before we can start thinking about loosening the restrictions. But when we loosen the restrictions, well, you'll remember that when we came out of the circuit breaker and the previous restrictions, we took one cautious step at a time. And I think that's the mindset that we need. Would you be looking at zero unlinked cases, for example, before the measures can be relaxed? I don't want to put a hard number to it. It's the pattern that we have to look at uh, and whether we see uh, community outbreaks, whether we see the control in the community, and also within institutions and organizations, that's the key lesson that we have to take away, that the restrictions that we put in place, they do work to protect us and our society. And this may not be the last time, right? I mean, this is what other cities and other countries have gone through many times. They open up and then they close back down again. They, they liberalize and then they lock down. And this is really our, our first step back since our circuit breaker last year. And in a way, it's a, it's a little bit like a, like a shock to us because it's the first time we've had to take a step back. But maybe we need to be a bit more resilient and understand we may have to, to, to take this step again in the future. Yep. All I can say at this point is Singapore jia yo, isn't it? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we, we know this works. We know that we can do this. We've done this before. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time. I hope our discussion has given you some insight on how to protect yourself and your loved ones. Stay safe.